Good morning. It's Wednesday, May the 25th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the, uh, in the United States today. So today, after the uh, Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare, the Star Spangled Banner, and the Pledge of Allegiance, we'll have Beto O'Rourke, Determinism is Dead, No Free Lunch, Fossil Fuels, and Hondo Chapter 10. All that and more when I get back. Thank you, thank you. And now the uh, Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare, Biblical Principles to Defeat the Devil for May 25th. You will experience great breakthroughs. My child, I have anointed you for breakthrough. I am the Lord, your breaker, and I will go before you. I have reconciled you to myself through my son and have given you the ministry of reconciliation. Your light will break forth like the morning and your healing shall spring forth speedily. You will worship me and sing praises to my name. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, break through in your prayers and be ever serious and watchful for me. Isaiah 61.1, Micah 2.13, 2 Corinthians 5.12, Isaiah 58.8, 1 Peter 4.7. Prayer Declaration. Lord, through you I will experience breakthrough in every other area of my life. Let me break through in my finances and all my relationships. Give me a breakthrough in my health with healing. Let me break through to new levels in my praise and worship to you. I will experience a deeper prayer life and will be ever serious and watchful for you to act in my life. Amen. And that was the Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare, Biblical Principles to Defeat the Devil for May 25th. Thank you, thank you. Who is the true conservative? He is religious. He is patriotic and uses common sense. He makes judgments, refuses to speculate, speaks clearly and definitively, and is not afraid to say no. He's open-minded and asks why rather than why not. He is consistent, credible, and influential, not ashamed of his existence, unafraid to learn or correct his mistakes. He is a normal American. Thank you, thank you. Philosophy. As Ayn Rand noted, everything we do is rooted in philosophy. 
The foundation of our philosophical thinking is the benevolent universe premise. True conservatives know, by the evidence of their senses and the use of their mind, the reality that the universe is benevolent and that success is to be expected. The left pretends that the universe is malevolent and that the failure is to be expected. Furthermore, true conservatives know that if a tree in a forest falls and no one was around to hear it, it still made a sound. That all knowledge is acquired and not innate, and that all moral standards and standards of beauty are universal. Thank you, thank you. Politics. All politics comes down to one thing, change. Whether or not to change, how, when, where, and why. All political positions, therefore, relate to one's position on change. The people that make the presumption for change are on the political left, and those who make the presumption for the status quo are on the political right. Everyone who makes the presumption for change is looking, ultimately, for a perfect society. Everyone who makes the presumption for the status quo accepts the imperfectibility of society and agrees to change only when there is an obvious case for change. The true conservative, and only the true conservative, is on the right. Everyone else is on the left. There is no middle and no neutral. The cafeteria is closed. Thank you, thank you. Government. All governments are about securing rights. In the case of tyrannical governments, the rights of the government. In the case of democracies and republics, the rights of the individual. It's one or the other, not both. Any civilization that divides rights between the individual and the government will not remain civilized for very long. The society will become paralyzed and vulnerable to threats from within and without. See Rome. This is a constitutional republic, and therefore all rights rest with the people and not the government. In a constitutional republic or a democracy, activist government is contradictory and illegal. Activist government presumes a government that has rights. The right to arrest, prosecution, conviction, and incarceration. This flies in the face of an individual's rights. Miranda, habeas corpus, the presumption of innocence, and just punishment. The government has authority and responsibility, but the government has no rights. Thank you, thank you. And now the prayer for the bereaved. Father, God of all consolation, In your unending love and mercy for us, you turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life. Show compassion to your people in their sorrow. Be our refuge and our strength to lift us from the darkness of this grief to the peace and light of your presence. Your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by dying for us, conquered death, and by rising again, restored life. May we then go forward eagerly to meet him, and after our life on earth be reunited with our brothers and sisters, where every tear will be wiped away. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, thank you. I was listening to Don Bongino, and he was talking about the... There's a press conference in Uverde, Texas, and about the shooting yesterday. And apparently, Beto O'Rourke was um, making some types of political statements. I don't know if he was uh, brought up to the stage to uh, say a few words or whatever, but he was turning it into a po- trying to turn it into a political rally. So... Um, of course, uh, Dan Bongino is analyzing what he said and just the general behavior and, and remarking. And everybody at the event, by the way, was uh, disapproving of him. You know, what are you doing? Why are you trying to do, you know, he's getting a lot of uh, flack. Now, uh, as I've always said, if you want to defeat the left, one of the things you have to do is 
spend less time asking yourself, what are they saying? And more time asking yourself, what are they doing? Okay, stop and think about this. You got a guy that's a, a politician. I, I, he is, aspires to higher office and he is out here making a fool out of himself um, at a at a very, very, you would think it's just unpolitic, stupid politically. That he's hurting his political chances, not helping them. So why would he do this? What What's up with this? What is he really doing? He's not really coming here because he expects that people are going to take his side, that he's going to rally these people and get them motivated to uh, throw out all the guns in the United States. He doesn't believe that for a second. I'll tell you what he's doing. What he's doing is provocation. He's being an agent provocateur. Okay, and what he's trying and looking for, he's in Texas, and he suspects strongly that most Texans are rednecks and that they are bigoted in um, a variety of ways, shapes, and forms. So what he's expecting is he's going to stand up there and he's going to run his mouth and anger the citizens of Uverde. And he's hoping that one or more of those people call him a fag and start using other that and other epithets to um, you know express their disgust. Because then... He can use that uh, politically for the elections in November because that's every, everything that's going on now has to do with the November of elections. What you're hearing from the um, right wing talk show hosts, uh, they're all getting trying to get everybody geared up to vote, vote, vote. You, you, you know, you hear it from um, Leo Terrell. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. It's not registered to vote, et cetera, et cetera, as though voting was the magic answer. And if it was that was the case, then then all of our problems would have been solved long ago. But anyway, so uh, that's what Beto O'Rourke is trying to do. He's trying to provoke somebody into shouting out, uh, maybe several people shouting out um, uh, slurs uh, against him, so that he can use that for. Uh, the November election. So he's sacrificing. It's like uh, martyring. He's martyring himself for the cause. But um, so once you know what he's doing, then you don't fall into the trap. Okay. You say whatever you got to say, but just don't use any type of bigoted epithets. And uh, his and his stunt will have gone for nothing. So again, to review, uh, Beto O'Rourke was apparently making a fool out of himself at a press conference in Uverde, Texas, uh, yesterday, and he was. Uh, it wasn't a question of what he said. It doesn't matter what he said. What was important is what he was doing, and he was acting as an agent provocateur to elicit bigoted slurs from the audience. Don't fall into the trap. Thank you, thank you. Determinism is dead. The government cannot prevent gun violence without necessarily violating the rights of its citizens. Today, uh, your yesterday, the uh, old Joe came out and made a speech and he said, we have to stand up to the gun manufacturers. And at first blush, that sounds, uh, sounds good, right? Uh, but, at the, uh, but when you understand where it's coming from, that it's a deterministic, that what he's suggesting is that we don't have free will, that the only reason that people own guns is that somehow the manufacturers of guns force us to have guns. Uh, the left likes to call it a gun culture, that we have some kind of a gun culture, and that's what forces us to own guns. It's crap. We have free will. We know by the evidence of our senses and the uses of our mind that that's so. Some of us own weapons, and, and guns included, and some of us don't. By the way, so uh, determinism is dead. The other part of this, uh, the government, federal government cannot prevent gun violence without necessarily violating the rights of its citizen. So old Joe is wrong, no surprise, again, on two counts, determinism and uh, prevention, uh, gun violence prevention. Don't be fooled. Thank you, thank you. And now, 
There's no free lunch. Quote, nothing is more deadly to achievement than the belief that effort will not be rewarded, that the world is a bleak and discriminatory place in which only the predatory and especially preferred can get ahead. Unquote. George Gilder. How cronyism can destroy the human spirit and create extreme cynicism is perhaps its worst component. Human action is a powerful force and human inaction equally so. When one believes the game is rigged, inactivity results. Cronyism strikes at the incentives of free enterprise and robs the would-be economic actor of aspiration. In this sense, cronyism joins collectivism as the primary enemy of a free and virtuous society. And that was, there's no free lunch. Thank you, thank you. And now, the moral case for fossil fuels. And when we left uh, the book, we uh, left with that, uh, where he's analyzing various different types of alternative energy sources. And he left by saying that Germany and various other countries are turning to a renewable biomass fuel from the past to make up for solar and wind, and that's wood. The problems with biomass, processing, and scalability. Biomass energy is derived from plant or animal matter, whether wood, crops, crop waste, grass, or even manure. Biomass includes biofuels, which are liquid fuels, usually alcohol, derived from these sources and used for mobile power. Other forms of biomass are used for fixed electrical power or directly for heat, such as wood or animal dung, burned to stay warm. In practice, biomass has, like solar and wind, produced a small amount of energy worldwide, although considerably more than solar and wind. Why? Biomass is renewable and natural because the energy comes from the sun, but not all the inputs in the process can scale. It resembles hazelnut energy. In fact, hazelnut energy is a form of biomass energy. To its credit, biomass has a storage system unlike solar and wind. Plants store energy from the sun through photosynthesis. The problem is it takes a lot of resources to grow them, namely the resources involved in farming, including large amounts of energy, land, machinery, water, fertilizer, just like it takes a lot of water to build solar and wind installations. But while solar and wind installations can be built in many places, though part of their problem is that northern and southern latitudes don't give them good sunlight for many hours, Biofuels need to be grown on relatively scarce farmland, which starts to bring us into hazelnut energy territory. It means that biomass scales badly. Often, the more of it we try to produce, the more scarce and expensive the inputs become and the more expensive our energy becomes. Biofuels like ethanol from corn or sugarcane or biomass from wood, complete with cropland or forest land, driving prices up for both fuel and food. Scalability has been the problem for every biofuel that works. The Bush administration tried to force us to use a cellulosic ethanol, a form of ethanol from non-food sources that has been promoted since the 20s, but still doesn't work at a smaller scale. Even if non-food biomass worked better than it does, it would still be extremely resource intensive to regrow over and over. A thought. Throughout history, it has been a challenge for human beings to produce enough crops to feed us because agriculture requires a lot of resources just to produce our meager number of calories. We need many dozens of times as many calories for our machines as we do from our food. If we could eat oil or electricity, we would, because it's much cheaper per unit of energy. Why would we feed human food to machines with hundreds of times our appetites? Already, the increased use of biomass energy is strongly correlated with a rise in food prices. The idea of selling it... uh, ten, scaling it 10 times or more to make a, even a dent in fossil fuels energy production is unthinkable, given all the evidence we have. Let's see. Biomass energy is not providing scalable energy, but it is making difficult for farmers to provide scalable food. Here's the bottom line with solar, wind, and biofuels, the three types of energy typically promoted in renewables mandates. There is zero evidence that solar, wind, and biomass energy can meaningfully supplement fossil fuel energy, let alone replace it, let alone provide the energy growth that is desperately needed. If, in the future, those industries are able to overcome the many intractable problems involved in making dilute, unreliable energy into cheap, plentiful, reliable energy on a world scale, 
that would be fantastic. But it's dishonest to pretend that anything like that has happened or that there's a reason to think it will happen. To be sure, solar, wind, and biomass may have the utility for niche uses of energy. If you're living off the grid and can afford it, an installation with a battery that can power a few appliances might be better than the alternative, no energy or frequently returning to civilization for diesel fuel. But they are essentially useless in providing cheap, plentiful, reliable energy for 7 billion people, and to try to rely on them would be deadly. And yet, our leaders propose massive bans on fossil fuels with the promise that these radically inferior technologies will be replacements. That reflects an ignorance of or indifference to the need for efficient energy and the value of cheap, plentiful, reliable energy. Any leader is thinking about making policy decisions with our energy and ultimately the energy and therefore the opportunities of 7 billion people had better take the truth about renewables into account. The secret to energy success, naturally concentrated, stored, plentiful energy. One lesson of the failure of renewables is that renewable is not a useful criterion for a good energy source. It says only that one of the inputs is derived from the sun. It says nothing about how long the other inputs will last. And most important, it says nothing about whether the technology can generate energy that is cheap, plentiful, and reliable. There's no reason to aspire to use an energy technology that we will use forever. The real question is, for the relevant time horizon, what's the most efficient combination of elements that we can transport, transform efficiently into the kind of energy we need in a way that is cheap, plentiful, and reliable? And so far in history, there's been one necessary ingredient to that. Instead of spending huge amounts of resources concentrating and storing a dilute and intermittent source working with a source that nature has already concentrated and stored for us, such as water, hydropower, the forces holding an atom together, nuclear power, or the powerful chemical bonds of copious amounts of ancient dead plants lying around from previous eons, fossil fuels. It is their pre-concentrated, pre-stored, plentiful energy content that has made fossil fuels, and to much less but still more important extent, hydroelectric power and nuclear power, cheap, plentiful, reliable energy sources. Hydro technology, cheap, reliable, medium scale energy. If you've ever been in a rapidly flowing river, you can feel the energy stored in the moving water. Hydroelectric energy technology transforms some of the power of that flowing water into usable, cheap, reliable electricity using a turbine, much like a wind turbine, except driven by a far more powerful and reliable force. Often a dam is used to store water near the source of a river and precisely control the downward flow. flow. Historically, hydropower has faced two types of limitations that have prevented it from producing much more than 6% of the world's power. One category is natural limitations. The other is political limitations. The main limitation of hydroelectric power is that there are not nearly enough suitable water sites for it to be a global source of energy. In China and Brazil, the two top consumers of hydropower, you can get a lot of electricity from it. In Nebraska, you can't. The United States has maintained a fairly consistent hydropower consumption because we've run out of rivers to dam, which is unfortunate because hydropower lasts for decades. The Hoover Dam was built in the 30s. But there's considerably more opportunity to develop hydro around the world. Based on the number of dammable rivers left, the International Energy Agency estimates that hydroelectricity has the technical potential to grow by 92% in Africa and 80% in Asia. Worldwide, according to an estimate by the International Energy Agency, hydro has the technical potential to produce twice as much energy as it does today. It's currently around 6% of global production. That's an exciting prospect, but not for most the not for most prominent environmental groups whom you might think would welcome a four times greater supply of cheap, reliable, non-CO2 emitting hydroelectric energy. Environmental activists have spent decades shutting down as many hydroelectric dams as possible, particularly large hydroelectric dams, despite hydro's proven track record as a cheap, reliable source of CO2-free power in the name of protecting species of fish, free-flowing rivers, and other justifications that focus on non-human nature. Sierra Club, on its list of accomplishments on its website, lists dams it has prevented or shut down.
If the standard is improving human life, those who believe that catastrophic climate change is coming unless we reduce CO2 emissions should favor damming every possible river to generate reliable CO2-free power. And for those who don't believe CO2's climate impact is a major problem, there's still a huge burden of proof on anyone to justify depriving people of a cheap, plentiful, reliable source of energy. Nuclear technology, reliable, scalable, cheap. With hydroelectric, we saw that a naturally concentrated stored sense of energy was a big benefit. If natural concentration is a benefit, there's no more naturally concentrated energy source than the uranium or other radioactive materials used to generate nuclear power. Nuclear's presence in generating energy around the world is slowly growing. While many feel that the focus in the nuclear process should be on safety, I think the evidence shows that the real controversy should be on price. Recall that to produce cheap, plentiful, and reliable energy, every element of the energy production process has to be cheap, plentiful, and reliable. Nuclear power uses uranium, which exists in enormous quantities around the world, and can also use thorium, an even more abundant material. Even using current technology, we're talking about time horizons upwards of thousands of years. The trickier part of the process is transforming that material into energy which is much more complex than, say, burning natural gas to generate electricity. The issue of nuclear safety is so full of much rhetoric and emotion that it can be hard to sort through. But as a starting point, let's ask, how do we know how safe it is? I think the most reliable indication of a technology's safety is how many deaths it has caused per unit of energy produced. In the free world, nuclear power in its entire commercial history has not led to a single death including for much publicized failures at Three Mile Island and Fukushima. Unfortunately, activists use inaccurate characterizations to make it extremely time-consuming and expensive to build new plants. All of these fears are plausible, considering that we've been taught to think of changing our environment in new ways as inherently dangerous. Nuclear power, in addition to requiring large industrial structures, deals in unnatural high-energy radioactive materials and processes. The opposition has led nuclear power to be considered far more dangerous than other sources unjustifiably, and that means that the nuclear industry has become an essentially government-controlled industry. In the best-case scenario, nuclear is still decades away from scaling to becoming a leading global source of electricity, let alone somehow providing transportation solutions at the level oil can. Thus, there is no prospect of nuclear replacing fossil fuels anytime soon. And that was the conclusion of chapter two from the book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, chapter 10 from the book, uh, Hondo by Louis Lamour. Now, when we left things on uh, chapter nine, uh, we were had checked in with uh, Miss Lowe and her son, and her son had actually been getting some uh, horseback riding lessons from Vittoro, who is uh, the son's new blood brother. And Vittoro is uh, wanting uh, Miss Lowe to, uh, Miss Lowe doesn't currently, her husband is away, of course, and so he wants uh, her to have a man around to be able to teach her son how to be uh, an, an Apache warrior, to learn the Apache ways. And so he's thinking about fixing her up with one of his Apache braves. She's not so sure about that. She's really, uh, she really wants Hondo Lane. And uh, so uh, that's kind of where we left things. Um, so now here in chapter 10, where is the adventure of Hondo Lane leaving the fort to go see Angie Lowe and get, try to get her and her son to come back to the fort with him. Unbeknownst to him, he's being followed by Ed Lowe and one of Ed Lowe's associates. Behind the stables, the line back was saddled and ready. Hondo Lane came around the corner carrying his rifle. He slid the Winchester into the boot and began tying his bedroll behind the cantle. He looked over his shoulder when he heard the approaching feet, his fingers continuing to work. It was Ed Lowe, and with him was Sergeant Young. 
See, Lo said angrily, it's my horse. That's my brand. He indicated the E.L. on the horse's shoulder. Sergeant Mike Young examined the brand as if hoping to find it a mistake. He looked up at Hondo. What he says true? Yes, this is his horse. Where'd you get it from? Hondo looked at Lo with casual contempt. From his place. That's where I'm taking it back. That's where he can find it. Young hesitated. He liked no part of this. He had no use for Ed Lowe. He knew he was a four-flusher, although a dangerous one. By the same token, he liked Hondo Lane and had ridden in several long patrols guided by Lane. He knew the man and knew him well. He also knew he had inadvertently walked into something of which he would have preferred to know nothing. There was a standing order that no one was to leave camp, but at the same time Lane was very close to Major Sherry and had talked with Sherry on the previous day. The order had gone around that no one was to leave, but at the same time the whisper had followed that no one was to pay any attention to the activities of Hondo Lane, and this had come from the Sergeant Major. Major Sherry disciplined his men with strictness, and he had company punishment and the court-martial to enforce it. The Sergeant Major had only two large fists, but a way of being convincing with them. Carefully and merely for the record, Sergeant Young said, but that's in Injun territory now. Strict orders against any white going in. Hondo pulled at his ear. Know something? I got a bad ear. Can't hear what you're saying. Coolly, he stepped into the leather, and then he swung the horse, and, keeping the stable between himself and the parade gear round, he rode off. Lowe grabbed the sergeant's arm. You can't let him steal my horse. Young jerked his arm free. You may be an ornery son of an anything you want to call him, but I'm not calling him a horse thief either to his face or behind his back. Let's try that again. Young jerked his arm free. He may be an ornery son of an anything you want to call him, but I'm not calling him a horse thief either to his face or behind his back. Abruptly, Young turned and walked away, glad to be out of it. Behind him, he heard Low swearing. As Young crossed to his quarters, he saw Fallinger come out of the sutler's store, and Young paused at the door of his tent, waiting. A moment later, Ed Lowe crossed the area and joined Fallinger. The two men talked, then walked away together. Sergeant Major Joan, Joe O'Bearn came out of the tent and glanced sharply at Mike Young. What's the matter? Young jerked his head toward the two, then quietly repeated what had happened. O'Bearn nodded. You did right, boy. Twas none of our affair. They'll follow him, I'm thinking. O'Bearn shrugged. Then on their own shoulders it'll be. He chuckled. If the engines don't get them, Lane will. And good riddance. Hondo Lane was moving swiftly, with no idea of those who came behind. He knew exactly what situation he faced. Between the post and his relative security in the basin where lay Lowe's ranch, lay miles of country, wild and desolate, crossed and recrossed by hostile Indians. Rarely did they move in as large a parties as those encountered by C Company on that fatal day of the massacre. Rather, they traveled in smaller groups of eight to a dozen warriors and were the more dangerous because of this. An Apache might be anywhere. This was his country, this heat-baked nightmare of waterless, treeless land cut by no streams and with few water holes, dotted with clumps of greasewood and cut by savage arroyos or uplifted ledges of black volcanic rock or sandstone. It was a weird and dangerous country over which to travel. No man knew better the art of concealment than the Apache. His own hide, his instinctive feeling for terrain, and his ability to live for days with little water and less food made him a fearful antagonist always. Hondo Lane rode into that heat-baked wilderness knowing exactly what lay before him. He had lived with the Apache. He knew his ways and much of his thinking, and he knew better than anyone how small was the chance that Angie Lowe and her son Johnny were still alive. Yet he knew also that the Indian was a creature of whim, and although cruel to his enemies or those who he believed were enemies, he could be kind to children. No Apache had ever been known to strike his child. He might beat his wife, but never his child. And the very fact that Angie Lowe was alive this long proved she had been fortunate. She might continue to be so. He moved now as he had moved before. He scouted the terrain before him, and only then did he move. He knew much of it, but he did not rely on that knowledge. He kept out of low places, held to the concealment just below ridges, 
studied every fresh track. He wore nothing that gleamed. The lineback's dun color shaded into the desert, as did his own clothing. With no weapons but his bow and arrows, his lance and war club or knife, the Apache had ruled over this vast area for generations. And when the rifle was introduced, he quickly learned its use and became an adept. Although always lacking ammunition, the Apache became a marksman in many cases, second to none. At noon, Hondo rode the line back into an arroyo and swung down, leading the horse back into the shade of an overhang. Some dead curl leaf lay in the canyon bottom, and he collected it. Then a few more sticks, all dry. He ate jerky with hard tack and drank two cups of coffee, hastily made over the fire. The dry wood made no smoke, and when the coffee was hot, Hondo extinguished the fire and carefully buried the coals, brushing over the surface with a loose branch. He squatted there, finishing his coffee and smoking, letting the heat of the day slip by while the lineback ate of the grass close under the cliff's edge. Sam lay panting in the shade a few yards off. Hondo leaned back against the wall and dozed. Not until two hours had passed did he move, and then he tightened the cinch on the lineback and stepped into the saddle. Taking his time, he worked his way out of the arroyo, careful to study the country before moving into the open. All afternoon, he traveled on, keeping a steady gait, but frequently shifting his trail. Several times he paused, studying his back trail. A faint dust was visible once. A dust devil? Or was it someone on his trail? At dusk, he was approaching Dead Man Waterhole, and he took his time. A mile from the water, he crossed the trail of four unshod ponies. The trail was scarcely an hour old. A word to Sam and the dog moved out warily, scouting ahead. Hondo moved up to a place among some rocks where he looked over the approaches to the water hole. There was nothing in sight. And then he saw Sam. The big mongrel was moving closer, belly down among the rocks. Only the faintest of movements rendered him visible. Hondo waited, his rifle ready to cover the dog if need be, but suddenly the dog lifted himself to his legs, seemed to hesitate, sniffing the wind, and then trotted toward the hole. Relieved, Hondo Lane got a foot into the stirrup and swung his leg over. The line back, sensing the water, walked eagerly forward. Dead man was a seep. The water was still but fresh, and Hondo drank, then allowed the horse to drink. Sam's muzzle was already wet. The Apaches had been here, but not remained long. Hondo mounted again, and they moved on. Twice he paused before darkness to study his back trail. He saw nothing. Far behind him, two horsemen rode out of a gully. Ed Lowe was in the lead, Fallinger close behind. Fallinger was a lean, dark man. He stared at the darkening hills. I don't like it, Ed. Lowe said nothing. He had already come farther than he had intended, but turning back was not part of his plan. He was a good man on a trail, but Fallinger was better. It had taken all their skill to follow Hondo Lane, although the big rider was making no undue effort to conceal his passing. He's getting deep in engine territory, and so are we, Fallinger added. What are you squawking for? He's carrying plenty, and you know it. Besides, he ain't going much farther without making camp. Fallinger shrugged. We never found his camp last night. We'll find it this time. They pushed on, finding an occasional track of the shod horse. Lowe had the added advantage of knowing where Lane was headed. He had said that he was returning to the ranch, and Lowe believed him. It was an added reason for continuing. No one at the post must ever learn he had abandoned Angie and his child at the ranch. He would not be allowed to stay around for one minute. That had been one advantage. At the pass, they knew he was married. At the post, they knew nothing of him except that he had a ranch and cattle. He had never mentioned Angie. At first, he had intended to return. It was not Indians that worried to him, but the long days at the ranch without company. Nor did he want to work. No sense in that. It was easier to play cards and win money from those that did work. So why be a fool? Besides, he had the ranch and cattle. When the Apaches settled down, he'd hire a couple of men to round up the steers and sell them to the army. The rest he would let run, and in time, there would be more cattle. Not being there, he'd lose a few, but Longhorns knew how to get along. A Longhorn bull would tackle anything that walked. 
They had been known to whip grizzlies. He tried to avoid thinking of Angie. The thought of her accusing eyes made him uncomfortable. She was all right, only when she had such notions about staying with the ranch, as if they wouldn't be better off in town. And she didn't want him to gamble. He won, didn't he? He grinned a little, thinking of how he won. But she didn't know that, and it was none of her business. Besides, he had worked hard enough for two men while her old man was alive. Lots of patchies moving, Fallinger said. If we don't come up with him tonight, I'm going back. Ed Lowe felt rising anger, but stifled it. Fallinger was no man to fool with, and besides, he wanted his company and his help. Ed Lowe was shrewd enough to know that he would get nowhere tacking Hondo Lane alone. The man's reputation had been acquired the hard way. Must be packing a thousand dollars, Lowe said, urging Fallinger's greed. Where else are we going to get that much? Take us to Frisco, if we live. They moved on as evening gathered, more slowly now. They were only a few miles behind Hondo at Dead Man. They found the tracks of his horse there overlying those of the Indians. All right, Lowe agreed. It's tonight or we both go back. They pushed on, low mopped sweat from his face. He had the feeling they were close, and now that they were drawing near, his mouth was growing dry, and he was tense. Long shadows stretched from the hills. The sun died beyond the mountains behind them, and the air grew cool. Lowe's shirt felt sticky and uncomfortable. Fallinger moved closer. From time to time, they paused, listening. Ed. Lowe turned to Fallinger. The gambler's face was white and set. I got a hunch, Ed. I got a gambler's hunch. We've had it. Irritation mounted within Lowe, stifling his own doubt. Don't be a damn fool, he kept his voice down. Hour from now, we'll have him right where we want him. It's him ain't going to get back. Their horses walked in sand. Ahead, leaves rustled. Leaves meant a cottonwood, and a cottonwood meant water. Edlow's hatred mounted within him. He loosened his gun, urged his horse forward, and then stopped. A faint sound reached him, a hoof on a stone, the creak of saddle leather. Lowe drew back, triumph choking him. We got him, he breathed. Let's move back a bit. We got him right where we want him. And that's the end of chapter 10 for Hondo and by Louis L'Amour, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. I'm Ron, your host, and the uh, only true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all of the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, and reminding you to listen to the John and Ken Show on KFI AM 640, Monday through Friday from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific time. Also, KFI needs to bring back Brian Suits and his show, The Dark Secret Place. Hashtag bring back Brian Suits. Until next time, be honest, be smart, be beautiful, and remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.